Yo, it's Let's Chat. It's time to talk about street epistemology. My name is Tyrone Wells Jr. and I'm going to talk to you about how to talk to anyone. Uh, we're going to go over a video of mine today. It's nighttime. Let's try to do this so that I can get a good night's sleep. How about that? <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a good night's sleep. There's nothing that can stop us with that. Anyway, uh, what we're going to be talking about is a chat that I had with a friend of mine named Shannon. Uh, he's a guy that I met over at the Ark Museum. Oh, check out this layout, by the way. Isn't this nice? Uh, anyway, uh, I had a uh, conversation with this guy. He is a pastor, and he came with a bunch of other pastors. And we ended up talking about their belief in God and what led them to their beliefs. And I only had my standard questions of, did you use a reliable method or not? I think this is a great way to show that you could really have these conversations with anyone, regardless of their stature in a congregation. Uh, pastors or, you know, uh, what do you call it? Pew warmers <laughs> alike. All of which can uh, have really helpful conversations with Essie. And I thought this guy really appreciated our talk at the end of the day. So let's go through this. It's about nine minutes long, and I think it's going to be a fun one. Shannon. Shannon? Shannon. 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 Yeah. Shannon, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. And I tell people I grew up in Georgia, live in Kentucky, so I'm from being a redneck to a hillbilly. <laughs> yeah, and I normally don't touch jokes like that. <laughs> it's an equal opportunity sort of situation. I feel like uh, people say jokes like that and you just leave your hands off of it. Anyway. I'm not going to outdo James. I'm not going to say anything James. I won't put it on YouTube, but we yeah. might say something really cool. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything that they have to say. I just have a couple of questions. Sure, I'll try to answer. He is referring to the group of pastors that I was doing interviews with just before he sat down. I think I did maybe about four in a row. And as a result, I'm a little bit, you know, um, I, I'm more of a live wire in these kinds of talks than I normally am because I've just gone through these motions so many times and dealt with the same arguments so many times that I'm probably also I'm this table is being surrounded by people. So I'm a lot more nervous than I normally would be. Uh, and not only nervous, but also just willing to just move forward past things that I sh would normally have more patience with if this was like a situation where I was setting up at a park and I just had fewer people coming up to me at a time. I actually did like 30 talks, 35 talks that one day and I was really tired by the end of it. So you might notice that I answer my qu I answer his questions a lot faster than I normally do and I do appreciate a pregnant pause or two. To the best uh, of my ability. Uh, What's your name? I'm Shannon. Shannon? Shannon. Yeah. Shannon, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. And I tell people I grew up in Georgia, live in Kentucky, so I'm from being a redneck to a hillbilly. <laughs> What's up? Um, you're an atheist, right? What, what do you mean by atheist? I can tell you if I meet that definition. Okay, so like I said, I'm I that's a spitfire response. So he said, So you're an atheist. And I instead of me being like yes or no, because you know, people ask that question when they're trying to set you up for a flow chart, right? I ask instead, what do you mean by an atheist? And I'll let you know if I fit that definition or not. That is such a better way of dealing with that question rather than having to deal with an argument of semantics ahead of time. And if, and, it, and what I mean by that is like, I don't want to get into definitions. I just want to know what he means when he says atheist, and I'll let him know if I meet that definition. If he thought atheists had wings, I'd be like, well, I don't have wings, and I call him certain myself an atheist. If you want to talk to an atheist that has wings or someone who thinks they have wings, Go talk to them. You're talking to me right now. Let's keep the fo conversation focused on the two of us, right? And that's the whole point of it. Like, I'm willing to work with any definition he gives me because it's only us at the table. But on that same note, I'll also let him know if his definitions towards me are relevant or not. And that requires me listening to what he has to say as far as what he's defining his words as. And then him listening to me as I let him know whether or not those are a relevant match or not. That sort of back and forth just keeps the conversation focused on the two of us, keeps us both open, and allows things to move forward in a smooth-like fashion. Okay. General definition of atheist is there is no God. That is not my def that is not my belief. So what is your def what is your definition? I don't have enough evidence to believe in a God yet. So again, he opens up the door now for me to explain what I mean when I say atheist, and I tell him what that means. It's not so much a, a, a disbelief that of any God, it's 
that, or how do I put it? It's not me saying, I think there's no God. It's me saying, I don't believe there's no God, or I don't have enough evidence to support that belief. And I think um, if you get your definition of what atheists is from mostly theists, you're going to get the straw man version where it's the, the strong, the, the absurd, I want to say absurdly, but the unrational claim that there is no supernatural being, which I don't believe there's any proof for either. Like I'm, and what I'm supporting is just, Hey, come up with a better reason to believe in a God and I'll believe in a God. Until then, I'm not going to believe because I don't have a good reason. And I like believing in things for good reasons. That's basically it. That's it in a nutshell. I'm thinking about, I'm going to think about uh, better ways of answering that. But, hey, you know, that's what we're here to do. So wouldn't that be more agnostic? Mm. Uh, so in my idea, agnostic is a statement about knowledge. And I don't know if a God exists. But I also don't believe in a God because I don't know if that God is real enough. I'm looking for better evidence to believe in that God. My position isn't that there's no God. Just my, not sure if there's a God. My position is I'd like better evidence or a better method to get to that conclusion. So would you And say I'm totally fine if there is a God and I just don't have that way to get to them. That seems like it's a problem between me and that God. So you say you lean that, you lean that there is no God. Ooh, look what he's doing. You see what he's doing now? So, like, I just gave that really, really nice definition, right? Agnostic means I don't know. Atheist means I don't believe. But he still, despite the fact that I just said, hey, I don't believe in a God, doesn't mean that I know there's no God. It just means that I don't have enough evidence to come to that conclusion. He's still saying, but you lean that there's no God. I'm like, dude, I don't lean either way. <laughs> Why am I talking to this guy? Let's let the video talk for him. But, no. He's he's still trying to get back to the flow chart of of his understanding because I know that me saying hey there's no God is an unrational position because I don't have any evidence for that but he's saying that there is a God and he doesn't have the rational position for that either or the rational evidence for it most more than likely I've seen this video I'm in it <laughs> but instead of him dismiss or instead of him saying like Instead of him challenging his own position of like, hey, I actually don't have enough evidence to support that God exists. Maybe the absolute confidence that I have that this God exists isn't necessarily a rational position for me to hold. He's instead going to attack my position, my proposed, my supposed position that I don't, that I believe there's no God. And then it, once he shows that my, that position is unreliable, he is going to purport that he's right by default and and present the fact that a god does exist it's a very standard play particularly by presuppositionalists particularly by preachers and you got to watch out for that so don't fall into that flow chart understand that what your position is if you are an agnostic atheist i don't know if a god exists there might be a god but i don't have enough evidence to come to that conclusion i don't believe that and so i'm at a position where i don't know is the best answer until i have better information if you're saying that God does exist, I'd love to hear it because I want to know things that are true and we can work together on that end to figure out if that's true, uh, if your information came from a reliable source or not or through a reliable methodology. I would love to know that. But for now, I don't think there's a more important question than whether or not a God exists. And I'm going to assess any information that's given to me with a really high standard of evidence. And if it doesn't meet that evidence, that standard, I'm fine with I don't know is a better answer until I have something that does meet that because there's nothing more important to me than whether or not a God exists or not. And I think I think that kind of intellectual honesty is what's going to make us look better at the end of the day as agnostic atheists than agnostic or than Gnostic theists or even Gnostic atheists. So just watch out for the flow charts. Know what your position is and try to answer honestly with an, and a willingness to know true things i'm sorry do you lean that there is no god no i'm not saying that at all i literally have no idea if there's a god here. okay uh it's literally the coin flip one side says there's a god the other side said there is no god it's like this in my head and it can only be one option my best answer is i don't know okay because that kind of negates my next question because my next <laughs> question was well what evidence have you had that leads you to believe there's no god yeah yeah so that that's exactly that. why i'm saying that Someone, if you came to me and said, I'm an atheist, I'm 100% confident that there is no God, I would have just as many questions for you as I would for now, literally every other person. Now, here. my next That's question, I'm going to ask you one of your own questions. You've been asking people, I'm just sure. curious how you would answer it. I'll try. What, you're asking people, what reliable test do you have to prove that there is a God? Okay. What reliable, what reliable test would it take to prove to you that there is a God? 
What reliable? Let's see. I don't know what the answer for this in the video is, but let's see. What reliable test would it take for me to believe that there is a God? Um. So yeah, for me, God is a very incredible thing, or the the concept that a God exists is like a really extraordinary thing. I would need a really extraordinary set of data or a test, something that's at least reliable, something that can be, you know, um, d repeatable, uh, something that could be tested on my own part, tested by people who know like a subject matter. I, how do I put this? If we're talking about as God, if that's as incredible as the Bible, that's going to be really, really rough because that's going to take more than just like a lab, you know, exam. But we can work our way towards there. And if this is a God that wants me to know about him, oh, man, then let's let's reassess some data, because right now I'm I am not confident that um, the character that is purported in this book is the character that is or a character or a God that wants to have contact with me on a regular basis. So, yeah, we would need to just outline some ideas of like what God we're talking about. That'd be great. And then what are some characteristics of this God that we can actually measure? So that way, when we do a test, we can know, oh, it was in fact from this God that we were talking about and not from some other God that was trying to play a prank on us or uh it basically we need to have tests that are falsifiable repeatable and ideally reliable so like if i know if we can like nail it down to just like hey i'm I, only a god can do these things and this is what it will look like when he does it and this is what it'll look like if he doesn't do it like that's a great test and if we had something like that that'd be great that's a great start at least um I hope we could get something like that in the future, but if we don't, hey, you know what? I don't know is a pretty good answer until then. And it's not saying that the God doesn't exist. It's just saying, uh, maybe we need a better way of measuring them. And right now we don't have a God detector. And that's that's probably the most, <laughs> it sounds silly, but it's the most unfortunately <laughs> true things. Like, hey, we don't have a reliable God detector right now, but once we do, then it's just like, dude, just push that button and see if it lights up. Oh, there's a God. Okay, great. I've changed my mind. You have a reliable God detector. Until then, we're just talking to each other and doing the best that we can. And all that talking, for me at least right now, all the books that we write, all the antidotes of people saying they died and went to heaven, that's just people talking. And I'm going to need more than that for it to meet my standard of evidence. And for me, a God is a lot more extraordinary than... Um, other things that I could persuade people about through just talking and with a book. Like I could say I went to Egypt for the weekend and I'd be like, yeah, that's okay. That's pretty, that's pretty incredible for just the weekend. That's pretty incredible. But you know, people can do that. That's possible. But if you're saying a God exists and there's a bunch of people who wrote about it and a bunch of people who said that and said they went to heaven for a weekend or stuff like that, I'd be like, no, dude, I don't believe that you're going to need a lot more evidence than that. Anyway, that was a bit of a ramble. I wonder if I answered that <laughs> in just a ramble. And basically, I'm just saying, hey, uh, it'd be nice to have three things. Uh, it'd be nice to have a test that we could do. It'd be nice if that test knew what it had like a frame of reference of knowing what it looked like when it was right and wrong. It'd be nice if we knew what specific God we were talking about and like what characters of that specific God we could actually test in a reliable and repeatable way where we know what it would look like if we were wrong. And if that was the case, at least then I'd be a lot more inclined to increase my confidence on that God existing if the test showed that to be the case than where I'm at right now where I'm just like, hey, I don't know either way. That's basically it. Okay, if it's a God that wanted to have in contact with me, that was like all powerful, all knowing, all loving, all good, that God knows exactly what it takes to convince me. And the best thing that I can do is just be open to that evidence. And I think one of the best ways to do it is be willing to like have a conversation with people who do believe, not try to shut them down, not try to come out with my own authority on top of that, not try to have apologetics for everything they say, but willing to be open and work together with them on a model to like get me to where they see it Correct. and see if we can rely with it. See, and, and I guess, That's my method. And, and I'm a James, you know, as far as there is not one thing. Sorry about that. You know, we can look at a lot of things individually. Okay. And they, like I believe the James, creation proves there's a creator. And okay, look at the symbiotic so. relationships within creation. All right, so 
how would I answer? How do I respond to the answer that I gave him? I think I'm fine with it. It started off as the uh, Dillahunty esque approach of, well, if your God's all knowing, He should know what it takes for me to, for him for me to believe in Him. And while I can understand the sentiment as far as like a persuasive way of talking to someone as a means to say like, hey. This is really where I'm at right now. Not so much, here are some other guy's words that I'm throwing in here so I don't have to answer the question or really think about what you just asked me. Uh, I'm saying, hey, if your God's really all-knowing, the best one, he would know what to do for me to be convinced, but I am on my, what I can do on my side is at least be open to that evidence and have conversations with people where I'm trying not to give biased questions and just try to have an honest dialogue. And that's honestly what I am trying to do in this conversation as well. So those two things combined, that Dillahuntianism and the Tyroneism <laughs> thrown together really make uh, what I feel a thoughtful comment. So like, good job, past Tyrone. Um, the response, though, that I got back from Shannon is basically an argument from creation. It's like, hey, so I understand what you're saying, but checked out all these things that are created that proves that there's a God. Things that are created prove that there are a God. I'm looking around at things that are created, therefore um, a God exists. And this is going to lead into, because I already know where I'm going to go with this if I, if I hear that word, is the breakdown of the argument from creation. So let's let's talk about that real quick. Argument from creation. How to break it down. Break down. All right. So how do you break down the argument of creation? Um, tends to be the case that people say creation without understanding a frame of reference of what something that's not created looks like. If they don't have a frame of reference for what creation is and isn't, how can they make a claim? So like if I don't know what creation doesn't look like, like that's that's going to be a complicated sentence. Let's back this up. If I don't have a frame of reference for what creation is or isn't, I don't really have a strong ground to claim that everything's a creation, you know. And his argument is that everything's a creation, and I'll verify that most likely. So, the the steps for breaking down the argument of creation is one: get them to verify what they mean by creation, or at least verify if everything's a creation, because if everything's a creation. Then ask them, what isn't a creation? Could you give me an example of something that's not a creation? Because now we have examples of things that they claim are creations, but if they don't know what something that isn't a creation looks like, then they don't really have a frame of reference for what a lack something that isn't created looks like. So I can ask them, hey, is empty space also a creation? Yes. Is like a black vacuum also a creation? Yes. Uh, it was like, <laughs> like just em like empty nothingness is nothing also creation. Like, yes, yes. Okay. So like everything's creation. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So is there any example of something that's not created? I don't know what that would look like. Okay. So if we don't know what something that's not a creation looks like, how can we make the, a claim with really high confidence that anything's a creation if we don't have that frame of reference? It's really important to know what something looks like. So like, for example, I'm going to break this down to like this. Hey, I know this is a fork. It's a dirty fork. <laughs> but if I didn't know what a fork didn't look like, or if I, if I said, hey, I know this is a fork. I know this is a fork. Um, I know this is a fork. By the way, I don't know what things that aren't forks look like. Would you believe me if I told you, if I pointed at something randomly in my house and said, that's also a fork too. Those four things, these are all forks. No, because I don't have a frame of reference for what fork looks like. And in the same way, this guy's saying everything is a creation. By the way, I don't have an example of what something that's not a creation looks like. And I d couldn't even come up with an example if I had to like think of one. It's important to have frame of references. And the lack of a frame of reference for someone who's using the argument for creation is how you highlight why that's not a good argument to purport that a God exists. So the steps that I'm going to do here, oops, sorry, did that again, is one, have them, make them commit to everything being created. If they don't commit to that, then that's great because now they have a firm reference we can move forward. So this isn't like so much a flow chart, it's just, I'm verifying how silly they're being with this argument, right? <laughs> step one. And then step two, um, highlight the lack of a frame of reference. Highlight no frame of reference. They need to have a frame of reference. So one, make them commit to that everything's being created. And if not, 
great because now they have a frame of reference and now they have probably a more reliable claim. Go on from there, see what, see what they have to say. But if they do say, hey, everything is created, literally everything, then highlight that they don't have a frame of reference for that and then move on to the next argument they're having. Also, um, don't waste time on this if they aren't resting their confidence on here. I'm only attacking the argument from creation because it's the first thing that he gave me, but there's likely a bunch of other arguments that he has afterwards. But you know, in this short time span of this conversation, I just went with it. Cause like I said, <laughs> I'm not being as patient as I normally am. Anyway, here we go. Uh, the precise mathematics of the, you know, cosmos, how uh, we could perfectly how we could perfectly you know, predict you know, where the planets and stuff are going to be. When you look at all those things together, along with the archaeological evidence, the historical evidence, the prophetic evidence of the Bible, when you put all those things together, that leads me to believe that it is the God of the Bible. I can see how you see that. So does that, does that make sense? So you, you, what I would, I, I've seen you out here, you know, oh, he's one got some momentum. One evidence. My only question would be, um, I agree that creation necessarily requires a creator. My question is, how do you recognize something as a creation rather than something that just is, or something that's not a creation? You know, and I, the analogy I like to use is, you know, basically... So, I'm just, he gave me a bunch of uh, partial uh, evidences for his belief, but I'm not going to play that game of musical chairs with him. I'm going to focus on the main one that he gave me, which was the argument from creation. So, that statement that I made is just to refocus the conversation on that main thing that he brought up in the conversation, which was the argument of creation. So let's see how he handles it. My opinion, all life forms are creation. Are you saying like all pieces of dirt, the sky, all life forms are creations? See how I'm, he's, he said all life forms, but now we need to know if he's also referring to non-life forms as well. Inorganic material, organic material, are they all Creations. Well, I like, like, you know, animals, people, their creation, but then planets, God created all that also, so it is all creation. It's all but, creation. Yeah, it is all creation. Empty space, vacuum, yeah, everything. God, God is responsible for it all. All right. Now we have made him commit, or at least explain his commitment to this argument. He thinks everything is creation. Empty space, planets, people, plants, everything. Everything is a creation. Now it's a question of whether or not he has a frame of reference for what something that's not created looks like. So my question would be like, how do you recognize a creation? Like what's the method that you're using to recognize something as a creation? I guess my answer would be the same. So yes, like, just the fact that it is here, the design behind it. That would be proof that it exists. And that's a good point. So what this fallacy is, is the, uh, it's called the conflation fallacy. Confla conflation fallacy. And I'm not calling it a conflation fallacy in the conversation, but basically what I'm saying is he's equating existence with, oh, I can't type today. Really can't type today. Oh my gosh. <laughs> with creation. He's saying these two things are the same thing. Anything that exists must be created. Whereas it's possible for things to exist without necessarily for it to be created. If you have the model where there are some things that are created and some things that aren't created. At least you would have a frame of reference for it. Um, to say that everything is a creation and to back that up by saying, well, things exist, only proves that things exist. It doesn't prove that they're also a creation. You have to take an extra leap to say it exists and it was also created. And the fact that something exists is not necessarily proof that it was created. You can claim it, but you can't demonstrate that yet, or at least he hasn't yet. So again, don't fall into that hole of, well, there's a tree outside, therefore there's God. It's like, no, there's a tree outside that shows that there's a tree outside. How did you get to the, the idea that it was created by God? Show me that. That's what we need to figure out. Because I'm open to it, if you can show it to me. But just saying it exists, therefore it's created, isn't enough. Which is kind of the picture I had with James. Well, it is, what it I'm is looking kind for of, is proof of its creation. It is kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of the argument of... Prove to me that a painting had a painting. Right, right, right. Because the term painter or painting, painting necessarily implies that it was painted, which would require a painter. Correct. Totally fine. But when I look at, say, like, uh, I don't know, like a rock, and say, this rock is a creation, 
what are we doing in our heads to determine that that is a creation? Uh, and I don't have an answer. I know what you're asking. I just don't have a suitable answer. Can I give you what I think? Sure, please do. And I'm about to explain probably the thing that I'm thinking right now, but basically I'm asking like, what's the mechanics that you're using to figure out if something's a creation or not? Because the mechanics for determining if something exists is by looking at it or observing it or do some sort of test to figure out its location and stuff like that. We have tests to figure out if things are existing or if things are created um, or if things have design or if things are complex. But it's not just as um immediate as just confirming that it exists you have to do an additional step along with that and by that i mean like um if something's complex it exists and it's not simple i know what simple looks like i know what not simple looks like this is definitely not simple therefore it's complex like I, there's a steps in my there's steps in that mental thinking process where you can categorize something just beyond whether or not it exists or not to determine whether or not it's complex same thing with design. I can look at something that was designed or something that was not designed and compare the two and be like, hmm, this looks like something that is designed because I know what things that aren't designed look like. I have that frame of reference and now I know that this is something that was designed. Same thing with creation. It exists, but I also have to consider whether it was a creation or not a creation. Maybe it just came to existence. Maybe it developed to some other process that wasn't necessarily propagated by a creator. And that falls into the umbrella of not created. So I have a frame of reference for what things that are created look like and what some things that aren't created look like. And I can look at something that exists and see if it fits one of those two categories. But the most important thing is that I have that frame of reference to determine which of those boxes that it goes into. And I only do that through informed mental processes that have a frame of reference. If I don't have that frame of reference, I can't come to that conclusion with a high degree of confidence. And sometimes maybe I don't know is the best answer, which is where I'm at, at least on the God question. So let's see how I answer it. Please correct me on this if I'm like wrong. Good, James. Because <laughs> yeah, I like to get yeah. feedback on this and let me know how appealing it is to you. We tend to recognize creations by comparing the things that are not part design by things that are not designed. If I went to a distant planet, it's a hypothetical, I know it's a real <laughs> <laughs> But if I went to a distant planet and we went there and there's this weird rock formation and it looked like a perfect cylinder straight up, I wouldn't know based on its surroundings if that was a creation by an alien species or not because I don't have a frame of reference of what looks like it's been designed on that planet. But in America, I can look at this temple and say, well, I know what temples are. I know the store I can buy those from. I know those created by things. Um, I can look at a tree that looks artificially, you know, bushes are like in the shape of a dog and be like, that's clearly not something that I would see in nature. I'm comparing this, something that I know is designed to something that I know is not designed. Like I have a frame of reference there. And because I have that criteria, I'm able to recognize when I'm wrong. I'm able to verify when I'm right. I can test it. I can have other people verify and get to the same conclusions as me. It seems like it's a reliable way to determine if something's created. If we live in the model where literally everything's created, what are we comparing against that to determine that that's actual creation? And if not, with everything is created, we may not have that thing that's not created to compare it to. And if that's the case, how are we justified at saying that everything's a creation if we can't recognize if something's been created? I don't have, I know what you're asking. I just don't have an answer. Could you please words. think about Except, that? You know, that you other... have one of my cards? Yeah, and I'm not forcing him to answer at this moment. I just, I'm hoping he thinks about this a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so you got one of your cards. If you could, if you, if you literally could put some thought into that, I know you'd be happy. Feel free to jump in if you have an answer. I had enough of Frank. He's had enough of me. <laughs> also, I, I, know what you're, I know what you're asking. I just don't have the words to put it into an answer. You know, if other, you want to take some time with that and get back than, to me, I would be happy to get you know, back to you. Other than, you know, I don't say I can argue that this is not a creation. Yeah, I would need an example. If you show me an example of something that was not a creation, then I'd be like, okay, now at least now you have a frame of reference. That's what I'm saying is. Okay, so check this out. I think I know what's coming up. Um, I'm saying I don't have... We don't have evidence to claim that something is a creation if we don't have a frame of reference. And I and I think he's going to try to do a quick shifting of the burden of the proof to try to get around that point. Let's see. We don't have anything that is not a creation. And because of that, how do you confirm that something is a creation? That's how, do you, how would you confirm that it isn't? Oh, you see what he did there? He says, how, do you, how did you confirm that it isn't? I'm going to highlight that. Isn't. A creation okay so again my point isn't that it's not a creation 
My point is that we don't have a frame of reference for, to decide either way. And you're not right by default if my answer is I don't know either way. So, like, if we don't have a frame of reference to determine if something's a creation or not, if you come to the table and say it's all a creation, you have to prove that. And in the event that you can't, it doesn't mean that I think that it's not a creation. Like, I'm not looking at this, I'm not looking at a mountain outside and saying, oh, that is clearly not made or created by a god. My argument is we don't have a frame of reference for that because I need to know what something that looks like. I need to know what something that I need to know what something that was created by God looks like. I need to know what something that isn't created by God looks like in order for me to be justified in saying anything's created by God or anything's not created by God because I don't have that frame of reference right now. And he's claiming that everything's created by God and doesn't have the frame of reference to make that art, uh, that statement because he doesn't know what the opposite looks like. And so by me saying, hey, I don't think we have a frame of reference. He's like, well, how do you know that it's not? That's not my argument. And it's a subtle shifting of the burden of proof to help him not have to think about his position in the critical mindset that he needs to think about it in. So I'm not going to take that bait. What I should do in this point is address, hey, uh, you're not right by default. And my position isn't that there isn't a creation my, or these things aren't creations. My position is that we don't have a frame of reference. And we should have a frame of reference before we start making, you know, assertions that things are a creation or aren't a creation. Let's just get a frame of reference. It's really simple. Why don't we do that first? Anyway, uh, let's see what happens. So like, it's not so much proving the negative because I can't prove something not true. Like I can't prove the negative of something. What I'm looking for is reasons to believe that it is true. And if you're saying something is a creation, I'm waiting for evidence to demonstrate that. You're not right by default until you can demonstrate it to be the case. Hmm. Looking back at this, I probably would have answered that differently because I understand what I understand the nature of what I'm trying to say, the gist of it. It's like um, I can't prove the negative, right? Like uh, I feel like that's a little bit more of an obscure term. What I'm basically saying is I'm not out here to try to tell people that they're wrong or why they're wrong. My argument is let's just have a frame of reference for what we're talking about. And if it's good, then I'll believe it because now we have uh, uh, informed point of view to come to conclusions on. But until then, my position's, I don't know. Like that coin flip, my position's, hey, I don't know. I don't know if this coin's head, heads or tails. I can't see the heads, I can't see the tails. So let's let's wait until we have better evidence before we come to a conclusion. Um, and then I said, you're not right by default, and that's also true. Like anyone who makes a claim of, it is this without the informed perspective of knowing what this even looks like or what the what a falsified position would look like um they're not justified in saying that and if i say hey i don't know what the answer myself but that doesn't make you right by default we both have to work together to try to come to a better assessment and so i probably could have answered that a little bit better i think um the answer at the first half was a little obscure but then i went to the you're not right by default it's fine in the moment i'm not gonna hate i'm not gonna hate on myself you did good past tyrone keep it up if you have a, frank well, I don't understand. you gotta sit down on the table if you want to <laughs> yeah. okay shannon's do done yes i do oh I no it's frank oh to, my gosh take some time to think about that. Well, I, I know what you're asking i just can't frank will give you a better answer that's why i just have to frank part two <laughs> Frank, listen, listen. This You're an excited guy, guy, and I don't want to talk to you, but I'm not going to talk to you if you don't have your sunglasses on. Uh oh. Just straight up. I'm I tired of you like moving your head. I know. Listen. <laughs> this okay, is the brilliant so... thing of my idea right here. It's just the best thing ever. I'm just like, I already I don't uploaded know. the video this time. He's a character. Um, Very interesting. So, so um, back end talk about what was going on in this conversation. I, um. That's my business. I ended up talking to Shannon by email a little bit after this conversation had taken place. Um, I probably wouldn't have contacted him by email or had that conversation with email afterwards because uh, I'm not good over text. I'm not really good. And for the most part, he just gave me a wall of text and then it was like really, really bad arguments. And so I try to say, hey, you know what? These, these arguments aren't very good. And I try to piecemeal them one at a time and show them why. And then that was followed up by another wall of text. And I'm like, 
I don't have time to, I don't have time for this. <laughs> so I stopped emailing him. And that's as much as that went. So, but I would say this. Um, in the moment, in that conversation, I think he had a lot of time to think about the stuff that he was talking about. And if he was around another person that knew how to do SE, or at least was willing to let him think about these answers honestly, we he would have had, had a much easier time co comprehending a better way to answer the questions that he was presented with today. And maybe potentially appreciate a, st a standard of evidence that would have made a more compelling argument for the God that he believed in, or at least have that informed perspective that at least give him an appreciation for having a frame of reference and use that to hopefully be the first person to say, hey, I actually figured out God existed. I have a frame of reference for it. Would you like to hear that? Because I'd love to hear that. So yeah, um, the whole point of this is showing how you can talk to anyone about anything because I want more people to be able to do this. I don't want this just to be <laughs> how many people can, how many people on YouTube do this? <laughs> it's like the number of people on, like on my fingers. There's 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 so many. This is so this is such an easy thing to do, and I just wish more people um, got into uh, SE as a hobby. It's really good for people who who may be good at arguing, may be good at debating, but want another option. And potentially a more powerful option to get the people that you're talking to to consider why they came to a conclusion and think about it in a really nuanced way with uh, the level of critical forethought that allows them to come to better conclusions and better methodologies and rise our overall standard of evidence for the things that we appreciate to be true. Um, that's it. Thank you guys so much for coming to this um, study session with me. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. I post videos on my channel at least once a week. Check them out. Um, I'll probably double up these videos or at least start putting them out on my Patreon uh, a little bit earlier. But the whole point of this is not to lock away any videos. I want people to see as much of the media as I can. So here's, there's no paywall or anything like that. But I'll, it, I, I will keep my YouTube channel to about one channel per week. But I'll also be putting these up on my Patreon account. Check it out if you want to. There's no payment required. I'm doing this as a hobby because I love it. So I hope you love it too one day. See ya. Have a good one. Bye.